Hello, and welcome to the Doc Exchange, a real stories podcast in partnership with the Grierson Trust. Every week, I'll ask a new filmmaker or filmmaking team about three documentaries connected by a single theme that have made a meaningful impression on their work and life. I'm Ollie Alexander. I'm lead singer of the band Years and Years and an out gay man. I've also recently come out about my struggles with my mental health. I have anxiety and depression and I'm not alone. There's a perception that in 2017 for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender people, it's all good. We have equal marriage, we're protected in rights, but... The stats tell us that 40% of LGBT people are likely to suffer with mental health issues like anxiety and depression, compared to 25% of the general population. That's outrageous. And I feel like it's something we are just ignoring. It's something that I come across all the time from fans of years and years in letters, when I talk to them at shows. It's something I know about my own personal experience, but also my friends who are in the community. I personally have yet to meet an LGBT person that hasn't been unscathed by growing up LGBT. I I mean, I haven't. I want to understand why and what impact growing up gay has had on me. I'm making this film while writing and rehearsing the difficult second album. No one can say I don't like a challenge. And again. And you're reaching for your brother's arms, the toots on flesh of the alarm, and I choke. It's too close. And you're standing on that highest stair. I think I'll run away from you, so I'll go. It's too F. Denji. I've lived with anxiety and depression since my teenage years. I guess I'm lucky because I recognised the problem and got help, but I do still have regular lapses. As a band, we're pretty good at talking about our feelings. Um, We've gotten better at it as well, and it's it's kind of a crazy environment to be in. I take my medication, I see a therapist once a week, and yeah, I have highs and lows. and I get freaked out a lot, but it's not as much as I used to. And I'm much better at managing stuff, you know. It helps that my bandmates Mikey and Emery are hugely supportive when I do have an anxiety attack or when I can't get out of bed. When you go on stage, you're on stage and there's nothing you can do to get out of that situation. <laughs> it's more acute for him because he's, he's right in the, in the front. Yeah. And singing, I think, is a very personal thing to do. Mm. We can hide a bit behind our, yeah. our synths. <laughs> but yeah, there's been a few times when I had to prop him up when he didn't want to go on stage or didn't want to go back on for the encore and just wasn't feeling very confident. When we're on tour, I just have to get into this quite like like a robot athlete. Like I'm just, you know, like focus, I go to bed early, I like have to be good to myself. Like, and I have to perform on stage and almost like not think too much about everything that's going on because I've had times when I've, um, you know, come, like just come off stage, like, and had like a panic attack, and I'm like sobbing, and then I have to go back on stage, and it's like, <laughs> you know, just like, you like take the microphone, and you're like on stage, smiling, and you're just like, this is a nightmare. Um, and then that's like not a good place to be in. I've probably been aware of my depression and anxiety for about 12 years, but I often wonder where it came from and what caused it. 
I've always kept diaries, so they feel like a good place to begin. What I started to notice when I was reading about these diaries is how really early on, I start to feel really distressed and I don't tell anyone about it, I don't think. So I'm 14, turning 15. I think my parents have just split up and I'm starting to really have like long periods of feeling low and feeling people don't understand me and like feeling kind of just unhappy and confused by it. 2nd of October, 2005. The other night was the worst it's ever been. I need to remember this. I remember dancing, that was awesome, feeling consumed by such incredible energy. But I was so hot, so I took my shirt off, just my small black T-shirt left. Dancing, and then Matt came up to me and saw my plaster on my arm. And then came the words I've been waiting for ever since I began. You haven't been cutting yourself, have you? <sighs> Boy. I just wanted to do it because I, I felt like it was... I had all these feelings I couldn't deal with, so, you know, harming myself was, like, seemed the most obvious way to deal with it. It felt, like, simple and, you know, it felt good to do it. But then it felt awful and then it was just this cycle. And then a year later, I kind of stopped doing that and I developed an eating disorder, basically throwing up food and just constantly, constantly thinking about what I'm eating. Like, I just write in pages of, I will not eat bread, I will not eat cakes, I will not eat chocolate, I will not eat bread, I will not eat cakes, I will not eat chocolate. It's a really hard thing to talk about. <laughs> um, that's why I'm trying to talk about it. Um, we want to tell people that we're proud and that we're happy and that, look, being gay didn't make me sad, didn't make me, hasn't made things harder for me, it's made things better, it's made things great, look how, you know. And it can be hard to then go, actually, I think maybe growing up gay in, in a straight world <laughs> um, has really affected me and has made me feel all these things and I think that can be a really hard thing for people to actually say. You know, I'm not saying that being gay means you're gonna be sad or you're gonna be depressed. I'm not saying that, but there's a link and I think I want to understand it better. Reading back my diaries, it's shocking to see how low I was at that time. I'm in a better place now, but I'm pretty sure that for me, a big part of my struggles with mental health are down to those years of coming to terms with my sexuality. During that time, I was living at home with my mum. Going home can be a difficult experience. I feel like you know, I was a different person when I was a teenager growing up. On the way here, I'm like, why do I feel sick? And it feels a bit like facing up to some painful memories. You know, I left school and then moved to London and I have a different life now. And it's like, now I'm realising that part of me has sort of tried to like squash down a lot of that and be like, well, I'm this different person now, you know? Sleepy Colford is a far cry from my hectic life in London. It's where my lovely mum, Vicky, still lives. Hello. Oh. 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 How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? You look lovely. Well, you look even lovelier. <laughs> <laughs> this is my old room. I moved here with my mum and brother a few years after my parents split up and my dad moved away. This is it. This is my room from about 16. I feel a bit like it's like living in a cupboard under the stairs. I think 16-year-old me was very, very emotional. And I felt a bit like lonely because I didn't really tell, I didn't, wasn't really telling anybody about it. I also felt really like I was maybe a freak. <laughs> like I was really different because people were just telling me that I was different all the time, really. Part of me really liked being weird, liked being different, thought that was, that was who I was. But then this, another part of me thought it was, just wished I, I wished I was like everyone else, wished I was normal. Normal, oh my God, I can't believe what I said, wish I was normal. <laughs> I don't wish that was normal. Yeah. I hate that word. 
I don't think my mum really knew what was going on for me back then, so I've decided it's time we talked about it. So, I've got something to show you. What is it? I haven't seen Mum for a few months and she's been going through all our old home videos. Terrifying. Is that me? Yes. The next step live is simple. Let's go with the songs. <laughs> well, it's the last Christmas of the 20th century and I'm so excited. Oh my God, I feel sick. I was bullied from when I was nine until I was about 15, but I didn't really tell anyone. I don't know if you knew, but in primary school, I started getting bullied. Well, I looked like a girl. They said I looked like really? a girl. Yeah, because I had long hair. And then oh. that became that I was gay. <laughs> <gasps> and then in secondary school, yeah, I started to, like, think that I was gay. And then mm -hmm. that became... I just wish I was just like, I don't want to be gay. Like, I... It was too much. I already felt like... People picked on me and then I was like, this is going to be even worse. And then I think, I, I don't know, it seems like I was just like putting jazz hands over everything. I think about when you asked me, did I know that you were gay? Yeah. I said, you know, I had a feeling that you might be, but maybe I didn't want to um, affirm that because of fear. Mm. of what your life might become like from all the homophobia that still exists out there. So the bullying... When I was, like, 14, 15, it kind of stopped. And then he s About started 14, becoming yeah. anorexic bulimic. As bulimic, really, and then having... I was restricting food as well, and I would self-harm. <sighs> I remember thinking, why is this happening? I don't think we really had a, a full conversation about that. Three. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I, I guess I think I, I might have been in denial, maybe, or... I felt so bad because I couldn't explain to you what was going on, and I felt ashamed of myself for, like, being the way I was, and I couldn't tell you, and, and like... Could anything have been different if you'd been able to talk to me? I can't help but feel guilty as a parent. What could I have...? Oh, I don't you couldn't have done it. There was nothing you could have done. You were... I couldn't talk about it. No. I wasn't come to terms with myself at all with anything. You're a great mum. You are a great I feel like I'm starting to sort of blame myself a little bit less. I can see why maybe I did struggle the way I did because I felt like I couldn't talk to anyone and I was ashamed of myself and part of that was because I was ashamed of being gay and no wonder really that it then caused me to get so low and, you know, feel the way I did about things. The shame I felt from such a young age must have had a major impact on my mental health. School was a horrible time for me, and bulimia and self-harm were my ways of coping. I felt I couldn't talk to anybody, not even my best friend, Georgina. Hi, George. <laughs> Sometimes I think the closer someone is to you, the harder it is to share. With Georgina, we were so close. We spent every day together. You know, there did come a time when we were aware that the other was going through some stuff, but we just, we didn't know how to have a conversation about it. Do you remember when we first laid eyes on each other? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I just remember you having curtains and a choker, <laughs> and a choker, and following, literally following me around like this. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> like, 
<laughs> You're like stalking me everywhere. <laughs> oh my god. And then, uh, yeah. Yeah. I was right. obsessed with you from the first <laughs> moment. Oh. George was someone who helped me to survive my traumatic school years. Oh my god, it's like it's not even here anymore. This is so weird, it's all gone. Yeah. I find it quite hard to actually remember stuff. Yeah getting bullied, but it wasn't really ever like that bad physically, but it just was being made to feel like I was different, like didn't fit yeah. in and stuff. Yeah. There was a general kind of vocabulary around you being used that wasn't, that wasn't positive, I guess. Yeah. Did you think I was gay? Always think I yeah. was gay? Yeah, but then you started seeing girls and I don't know. I guess, yeah, I was confused looking yeah. Uh, like from a friend point of view, yeah. And always knowing, but then never, maybe never having the courage to bring it up with you or something, even though we were really close, but uh, I don't know how you would have yeah. been like, babe. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know that you're gay? I think Ooh. you're gay. Yeah. <laughs> I think at school, I learned that people around me were my enemies. <laughs> you know, like other kids were going to be mean to me. I was always on guard, on the defensive all the time. It just creates this, like, even talking about it now, I'm like, oh, I'm getting anxiety about it. And it's, yeah. I never liked spending time with, with kids my own age because I thought they'd, they'd be mean to me. And that, yeah, I guess I learned that at school, that I didn't fit in with them, so I should, I'd have to go find somewhere else to fit in. Looking back, I think that rejection had a huge impact on my mental health. George wants to take me back to one of her old haunts. We dance together a lot in our teens and we can't help but repeat old habits whenever we get together. And I do not need any excuse to dance. Sorry, put a mirror in front of me and I'm just like, sorry, I'm too busy looking at myself now. <laughs> and turn. And we used to make our own dance routines yeah. up. Yeah. Scoop. Scoop. Sh loop. 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 Scoot. Scoot. <laughs> <laughs> it feels just like old times, but a lot has happened to both of us. Whilst we've both grown up queer, George has only recently had the courage to come out, and she's had her own issues to deal with. I started having kind of breakdowns in yeah. like at the end of primary school. I would just cry and I didn't know why, and, um, and then that kind of continued throughout um, secondary school as well, there were like moments of um, just real distress. Um, I started developing symptoms of an eating disorder when I was like, 11 or 12. I knew you had a difficult relationship with eating. Mm. And then I think I then told you that I thought I was bulimic. But I remember that conversation. Because for me, kind of being confused about these feelings that I was having, and trying to suppress them because I wasn't, I didn't know what to do with them or where to place them in terms of trying to dull it down and not act on it or not even knowing how to act on it anyway. It was really good to hear that stuff. And part of me was like, why didn't we tell each other at the time? But, well, I wish that the first time I was questioning my sexuality, it had felt safe to, to say, oh, I don't know what my sexuality is, maybe I'm gay. I wish that had been, something I could have done, you know, because it wasn't. <laughs> and so that's your first introduction to your sexuality is that it's wrong and that you have to hide it. You cannot underestimate shame. The moment it kind of creeps into your life from a really young age, for LGBT people, the moment that you realise that you're different to everybody else, that just plants the seed of toxic pain and it just grows and grows and grows and then it just gets larger and larger as you grow older and I think that has a huge impact. I left school 10 years ago now and I doubt the effects will ever leave me. I'd hoped things had changed, but a brand new study by Stonewall shows that half of all LGBT teens are bullied at school. Today I'm meeting a young guy called Connor just turned 15, um, he's gay, and he was bullied out of his school. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, mate, you all right? Yeah. Hi, Connor. Hi, Ollie. How are you doing? Good, thanks. How'd you on the school? 
usual, just boring. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> well, school's definitely not changed that much then. When did you come out at school? 13. Right. I feel like it's a really brave thing to come out as young, yeah. young as you did. <laughs> um, how bad did the bullying get? At one point, a group of girls had spread a rumour that I'd said I'd done stuff with an older boy, and the boy found me the next day, grabbed me by the throat at the top of a set of stairs and pushed me down them. Wow. Mum phoned the school, had a go at them, and I think the next day or something, she had a meeting with the headmistress and told her right, I'm um, she's taken me out of school and she ain't bringing me back. You feel like... You're alone, you have no one to go to, you feel insecure about yourself, you feel like there is completely nothing you can do to change it. And people do targeting you for no apparent reason apart from you being you is just heartbreaking. At one point I was self-harming quite badly and I, I do still have scars from it. I was quite suicidal. I admit I did try to attempt it because I didn't think I deserved to be here anymore. I felt like I was to disgrace and I couldn't turn to anyone. Did you talk to your mum? No, I didn't talk to anyone. I pushed everyone that I was close to away from me. I think it's really, um, it's so hard to talk about, you know, thoughts of suicide. Yeah. Because I think it really scares people. It's a scary thing. It it? Is, and yeah. it really scares people. Yeah. Um, it obviously, it's so, it's so good to talk about it. Yeah, it is, yeah because it relieves people from stress and thinking they're like alone and feeling that way and you can help other people get out of that state yeah. because you know what it's like being in there yourself. Connor isn't alone. Stonewall's study shows that two in three LGBT teens will have self-harmed and one in four, including 45% of trans pupils, will have attempted to take their own life. It's so awful to think that these young people can't imagine their bright futures whilst in the midst of being bullied. I want to find out how Connor's mum, Helen, coped with her son being in crisis. He was very depressed, very suicidal, um, self-harming. Um, how did you know that that was going on? He didn't tell me. He's just got very withdrawn and I didn't trust him being on his own. Um, I knew something went right. Um, and I met, I used to make him get in bed with me just so I knew where he was and that he was safe so I could get sleep. And you feel that you failed as a parent. You really, really do. I just want to say, Sorry. no, no, don't apologise. Um, I want to just tell you that I have had a conversation with my mum really similar to this and she said, like, really similar things because she felt like she didn't know what was going on with me when I was at, um, at school. Yeah. And it was really hard for her, I think, as well. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. 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 Get upset. I don't mean to upset you. I'm sorry. Please don't apologise. No, you do. You feel like you've failed as a parent because your job as a parent is to protect your child and you can't protect them from everything because you're not there 24-7. Of course you can't. Of course you can't. How people could not speak to their children just because they've come out as transgender, bisexual, lesbian, gay. So bloody what? They're your child. Yeah. That's you. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> when she was talking about... Connor having thoughts of suicide. Can't imagine, you know, someone, you know, saying that to my mum. Even though, you know, like that I did have some really dark thoughts at that time. And you don't know, don't know how to deal with it. With his mum's support, Connor is doing so much better. She's found him a local LGBT youth group called Blah, where he gets to hang out with young people like him. Hi, guys. Hi. This is Ollie. Hello. I think just goes to show, like, Connor was going through all this stuff, and then it took him talking to his mum, leaving a school, but then finding a youth group for him to then start feeling more on top of things. 
having youth groups and having places where young queer people can meet each other and share stories and like find support with each other is just so good. It's been so good for Connor. If I had a LGBT youth group, that would have been amazing. <laughs> For many of us, our introduction to other LGBT people is through going out on the gay scene, which is exactly what I did when I was 19. I moved to East London and I started going out a lot. And it was kind of this awakening in, in some ways because I was meeting all these people that I was so in awe of. They just seemed so self-possessed and colourful and vibrant and they were always at these clubs every weekend and I would go every weekend and I would get to know everybody. And I started going out, I think, too much, like Thursday to Sunday to Monday every week. And now when I think back about it, I think for it to be really focused around partying, drugs and sex, it can really, I don't know, slip into a really damaging cycle. And it can, I think, really, if you're already a vulnerable person, it can really just trap you and it's hard to find a way out. I am meeting a guy called Sean. Um, he's 25, he's from London, um, and he is going through struggles with drug use. Sean is fresh out of an intensive drugs programme, and I'm nervous to meet him as this issue feels close to home for me and many of my gay male friends. Uh, hello. <laughs> you finally get to me. <laughs> it's nice to meet you. Oh, I'm so hot person. Oh. I'm keen to break the ice with Sean, and dancing is always a good way to do it. Yes. Oh, no. Which? Oh, wait, which leg is that? Right yeah. there. The side. You already did it. Bring it back. Travel. Travel. Slide. 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 Wait. <laughs> I want to ask Sean what he thinks may have led to his addiction. When did you come out? I came out officially when I was 17. OK. Um, I got forced out, really. My mum asked me one day, are you gay? And it took me a good 30 minutes before answering because it was kind of a big decision for me. So I told her the truth. It had a backlash. Fuck. She told me to go to my dad's. So she like basically chucked you out? Yeah, it was very hard. I took it very, like, rejection um, from my own mother. It wasn't eventually till my mum said, I'm not upset that you're gay. I still love you. You're my son. Um, I'm more scared that if there is a hell and the Bible says you're going to hell, you will be there and if I do go to heaven, I will be there. How would I live in peace in heaven? It was hard to be by myself. I had to learn everything by myself. Um, so yeah. it feels like, yeah, like loneliness and like isolation is something that like a lot of queer people experience. Yeah, exactly. And... School was horrible. You tell someone a faggot, that straight away is like using the N word, if I'm allowed to say that. It's, it's rude that created a lot of friction and <clears throat> a lot of fights broke out, a lot of arguments. That's the blessing in the isolation, I guess. I, c I can only say, it, from my experience, it pushed me into dark places. The whole culture of cruising, it, it felt so... Because it was secretive and I was secretive, it went hand in hand. No one asked my name and then they didn't have to. I got what I wanted, they got what they wanted, went on separate ways. What do you think you were looking for, like, when you, were, when you went cruising? Acceptance. Someone to love me. Um, I didn't get much anywhere else. Then, as soon as I hit 18, I started sex clubs and saunas, dark rooms. Did you feel like I went too far, like, on occasions? Yeah. I slipped into typical gay drugs. I began with MDMA and then um, meeting one person, they helped me into what the gay community called slamming. And slamming is when you inject yourself. And I was injecting crystal meth. 
I would be around people who would give it to me and I would give them my body. Unfortunately, the hard lesson had to come from it. And unfortunately, I was um, drugged and raped. Um, and through that, I got given hepatitis C. Now, I'm still on treatment now for it. I fully can't remember the, the rape. I just remember waking up and crawling back home. I'll be honest, after the rape, I didn't stop. I craved more. I craved, I felt dirty, so I, I had to be in the dirty area. In my head, that darkness was my friend. When rejection comes at you from all these different sides and you're, you're, all you want is you're seeking connection and intimacy, if you even get a shred of acceptance from, from anybody, from anything, like, like maybe Sean got when he first went cruising or he got when he first went to a party, you know, like that is all you have to cling to. So of course that's just gonna reinforce itself. I know that when I was first sort of going out in the gay scene in East London, it was just a given that you would do drugs. You know, it went hand in hand with like partying, celebrating and dancing. And that, that's kind of, you know, the positive side of, of, of gay nightlife. But then it so easily tipped in, tips into really damaging behavior. The feeling of rejection got worse for Sean when he felt he couldn't be accepted by either parent and was left homeless, sleeping rough in Soho. I was on the streets for a good two weeks. How did you survive? Um, do you do all the bad, rough things that you shouldn't really be doing? It was just a bad moment. Um, it was the wrong way to go about things. It was the wrong way to find who I was. Um, I feel like you didn't have a choice. Like, just when you're saying, like, oh, it was the wrong way to do things, I just, I don't know. It's the lowest point of my life that I ever got to. And I hope I never get back there again. Yeah. Really. Yeah. It's yeah. hard to hear you talk about it. Yeah. Sean isn't a one-off. Young LGBT people are much more likely to become homeless, making up almost a quarter of young homeless people. For most of them, like Sean, their sexual or gender identity was a factor in their rejection from home. Hearing Sean's story has really affected me. Meeting Sean is it's just very close to home and, you know, not just my experience, but so, so many people who are close to me and people that, you know, aren't here anymore because, or for, for whatever reason, and I just, like, I just think it's, oh my God, <laughs> I'm not going to cry and, like, like Selfie, get in my kitchen. <sighs> Addiction is a form of self-harm. Bulimia is another and it disproportionately affects gay men. These are usually coping mechanisms and there's often a secrecy around them. With my bulimia, no one really knew. You just can't tell. Today, I'm in Brighton to meet a gay guy called Tom, who is still very much in crisis. I'm really looking forward to meeting him. Also quite nervous, um, I suppose, because I've never actually spoken that much about my bulimia. And every time I do speak about it, I talk about it like it was a long time ago. I'm quite uh, apprehensive of um, discussing it with somebody who's, who's going through it. Tom is a 21-year-old English student at university. He's had to defer his final year because of his poor mental health. When I was about 15, I started um, sort of turning to food to sort of cope with various things, and that's when I started to start binging and then purging and making myself sick. And sort of on and off, I've used that over the last five years, um, sometimes like really intensely, sometimes not so much. Um, yeah, as either a coping mechanism, a way of, of controlling my body. And then in the last few years, it's probably got into its 
most intense point uh, while I've been at university. At his worst last year, Tom was binging and purging up to six times a day, putting his body under huge amounts of pressure. I think it's probably got a lot to do with coming into my own in terms of my sexuality, starting to like try and dip my toe into like dating guys and actually sex. And I think that's when the pressures of looking a certain way, acting a certain way, have really sort of got to me. And then alongside, I'm just finding university difficult. Uh, is there a specific thing that makes you feel like, that you think, okay, now I'm, this is making me feel really bad? I've got myself into a pattern now where I, I weigh myself constantly throughout the day. Um, and so that's become a very big sort of fixture, is trying to keep that at a certain level so that I'm always comfortable with where that is. Um, and so if, if that, for any reason, has like gone up or down a bit, then that will often sort of trigger certain behaviours. How do you feel about stopping? The idea of stopping, yeah, it's an impossibility. I have no idea how I would go about stopping. I can't really picture a life where I don't do it, because I don't know what I'd do instead. It's such a difficult... I mean, I found it so difficult to even want to stop, and I can see that's something that he's grappling with now. Something about sharing, sharing that feels really good, feels good, actually. Speaking to people who you share an experience with can be so powerful. Tom and I have arranged to attend an eating disorder group together. I'm still dealing with my issues around eating and feel nervous about opening up. Yeah, we're going to the UK's only men-only eating disorder group and sitting on their session. Um, so that's going to be really interesting. The session is being run by Dr. Will Devlin from Men Get Eating Disorders Too. Well, welcome. Lovely to have you here. Tom and I are joining members Lawrence and Michael. I was diagnosed with bulimia last year, but uh, I started um, sort of showing the symptoms when I was 15, 16. Um, I'm 21 now, and I'm still struggling with it quite a lot, I'd say. I'm still in the throes of it. I don't feel like bulimia is really a part of my life anymore, but I still have this difficult relationship with food. I feel like yeah. it's like your brain gets rewired at some point yeah. along the way. It sees food or it thinks about food in a certain way and, and then once it's wired like that, it's so hard to just yeah. do it, you know? Everyone seems to say that it all happened like 13, 14, 15 as well. Is there like a reason for that? Does it relate to um, how we connect with people at that formative age? And if we don't, then what do you use? Do you, know, do you go into drugs or do you go into alcohol abuse or do you go into uh, eating disorders? I just was so wanting people to take notice in a way. If I just said I'm sad, people would be like, okay, sure. But if I'm like, no, I'm actually sad and ill, then they might take it a bit more seriously. I ended up going to hospital and you know, I had a really irregular heartbeat and the doctor was like, are you throwing up? You know, I, I'd kind of was, I kind of admitted that that was what I was doing and she was like, well, I think this is because of that. I felt so ashamed that, you know, this was what's happened and I'd drawn so much attention to myself and, you know, I felt like it was really serious. Um, but I still carried on, really. It took me another, like, four or five years to sort of stop. Tom, I wonder what it's like to hear the other guys, because in some ways you're at quite a different place in the journey. Knowing that there are people who are better, it's a nice reassurance but it's still such an unreal concept. It's certainly not making me think, oh, I'm still in the middle of it, how shit for me. It's just such a foreign concept, I'm still not sure how I'm processing it. Mm. Just to hear from other people is so much more important than anyone ever gives it credit for. And there's something so important about knowing that you're not the only one yeah. battling something. I can't tell you how brave I think Tom is. I can't imagine what it must be like to still be in the middle of that and be talking about it. I think it's an incredible thing that he's doing. Tom's just done something I never did, open up about his eating disorder while still going through it. Hopefully, it'll help him recover and overcome the stigma. I've decided to take this idea of talking about things to a whole new level. So I'm in London, I'm in East London, and tonight we are putting on a mental health themed night at The Glory, um, which is a local gay bar. And we're gonna have performances. And yeah, I think it's gonna be really, really fun. I'm really excited. 
I'm putting on the night with East End drag royalty, Johnny Wu. Hi, Johnny. Hello, how are you? <laughs> oh my God, this is amazing. I know, this is my honesty box. Oh God, let me look at this. <laughs> do you it's like it? It's beautiful. Did you do it yourself? Yeah. I'm just going to set up here then. I made this honesty box to allow people to post their true fears and anxieties. It's clear none of us are talking enough about mental health and I want this event to encourage people to share. Some will do this through performances and I hope for others, my box will be a start. I think as queer people, we, once we come out and I think it's, there's this uh, pressure to sort of um, behave like everything's fine and you, you, you're happy and proud and it doesn't matter who you are, there's really a stigma around talking about mental health. It's hard for everybody and but I think there's a kind of a, it's quite, a specific issue in, in, in the queer community that I think is, is makes it a hard thing to address. Owning up to there being a problem is a good step forward. Hello. The next step, throw some glitter at it. Ladies and gentlemen, it is the Ollie and Johnny Show! Yeah. Oh, welcome to the Glorious Big Gay Mental Health Night. <laughs> and getting to the bottom of gay mental health. Now to enlist some confessions and darkest fears. Can you come and write in my mental health box? Oh, I might. I mean, I've got a story in Aftertale, so... Put it in. You're like, thoughts and feelings, like secrets, whatever, confessions. So it's like pens and paper and stuff like that. I'm supposed to stay clear of queer company. People with mental health problems, they just need a little bit of respect. Just kept getting loads of notifications, and one of them was from my dad. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for the room. Incredible. Cheers. Oh my gosh. Um, I don't know what to say. It was, it was amazing. It was so good. I asked people to put their confessions in my honesty box. OK, this one says, it was freaking scary, but then one day my teacher pulled me aside after school and told me about their gay friend. It was the first time I'd heard that you could be gay and happy. My depression lifted and I came out soon after. It's nice. This one says, I hate my body. I do not like what I see in the mirror and I feel I will never find a partner until I look better and fit the gay stereotype. And it makes me really sad and hopeless sometimes. The hate of homosexuality that the world instilled in me as I was growing up stays with me. It is a battle that I attempt to overcome every day. It's quite shocking to read these because you're like, I was there tonight, like everyone's having a good time and it's like, you can have a good time, but you know, people are actually feeling these things and, and you know, this is like, an, you know, that's like honest. Nothing is going to happen unless we talk about this. Like, it's just not. Like, we can't pretend like things are going to get better if we don't fucking talk about it. Um, sorry. <clears throat> like, it's just not. Everyone I've spoken to was either bullied at school for being LGBT or it was made clear that it was shameful. Imagine the benefits to them if that had been directly challenged. Today I'm at a school in Wood Green in London and I've um, been asked by an organisation called Diversity Role Models to take part of a workshop um, that's all about LGBT issues. Um, and my good friend Paris Lees is thankfully doing it with me. Hiya. What are you doing at the bike shed? Oh, you know me, just <laughs> hanging around. <laughs> How are you? Yes. I'm so nervous. Yes, me too. <laughs> it's exciting as well though, right? Yeah, it'll be good. It does look like a nice school, actually. Yeah. Gemma Curtis has been mentoring us in how to be good LGBT role models, and she'll be holding our hands throughout. How are you both feeling about telling your stories? It's good. Yeah. <laughs> I'm excited, but I'm really worried I'm going to cry. Oh, no, don't. <laughs> no. 
How many times have you done this, do you think? Oh, wow, it's good. It's um, 100, 100. Really? 100. I'm not going to lie, both Paris and I are petrified. This is the first time I've been inside a school, I think, since I left. And I try, like, to not think about, like, young me very much, because it makes me sad. And then when you're around just, like, loads of young people, it reminds me of when I was young. Um, Ollie is going to introduce a bit of a game. Anagram game. So it's going to be some words on this side that are jumbled up. And I want you to rearrange them into words they actually are meant to be. Lesbian. Shout out. Lesbian. 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 Okay. Bisexual. Woo! <laughs> very good. That was very quick. Oh, yeah. Very impressed. OK. What do we think might be the key issues that somebody who identifies as LGBT would be dealing with if they were in school with you guys? Yeah. Bullying. bullying. What kind of bullying might that be? Stay away from your adult to be friends with you. So rejection. They'll feel bad about themselves, like, like being gay or lesbian. Low self-esteem. Low self-esteem, yeah. Is it ostracised? Yeah, that's yeah. a good word, yeah. I think because, like, sometimes people aren't comfortable coming out to their parents and, they, their parents might judge them. They think other people might be worse and, like, act differently towards them. Excellent. I don't think this board is big enough, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Let's give Ollie a big round of applause. Thank you. Uh, yes, so my name is Ollie. Hello, it's very nice to meet all of you. I was going to tell you a little bit about my story, my time at school. You know, people would start to say to me that um, the things that I did were gay or the, the clothes that I wore were gay, and they meant it in a negative way. And they told me to stop being gay, you know, stop behaving gay, that I was a puff or a fag. You know, they'd make fun of me or they'd push me around in the playground. And I was really terrified that I might actually be gay. <laughs> like, maybe they were right. Like, the things they were saying to me might be true, but I didn't want to admit it, like, because I thought being gay was a bad thing. I felt ashamed. I think the words we use are so important. We can't forget that. I really hope you've got some questions, and you're going to write them down on a post-it note. Now it's time to see if we got them thinking. Oh, good question. Did you ever use the word gay in a negative way yourself to fit in, Ollie? Um, I think I probably did, you know. Yeah. The, the pressure to fit in is really big, isn't it? Did you get help from your school parents? No, and it's a really good question. More kids are being supported in schools now, and I think that's a really good thing. With the support of their school and their family, they are much more likely to be happy, healthy, and not have problems. How can I help my friend with coming out? Supporting your friends who if a friend who wants to come out is all about just, you know, being respectful of their of how they feel. And if you do see abuse or your friend suffering, you're ready to step in and, and help in some way, even if it's just being there for them. I wish I went to this school. <laughs> I wish I'd gone to this school too. We've done research which shows that two years, three years down the line, they still remember the facts of the stories of the role mm. models that came in. Yeah. So your stories kind of yeah. will seep in. People and they will remember, remember stories, yeah. Yeah, they sure. do. I mean, I just keep thinking if this had happened in my school, it, would, I just, it blows yeah. my mind that it can happen yeah. in this environment. It works too. On average, in all the schools diversity role models have worked in over the last two years, over 40% of students said they use homophobic or transphobic language before the session and only 15% would after. It's great what they're doing, but why should a charity be doing this? Shouldn't schools be addressing this anyway as part of the curriculum? Without a shadow of a doubt, it would have made such a difference if I had had LGBT inclusive sex and relationship education. It would have helped me in so many ways, and it would have helped other queer kids, but also it would have helped the kids that weren't queer, that were straight. Like, everybody benefits from this kind of sex and relationship education. I'm learning more and more the benefits of how good it feels to talk about stuff and also being honest with yourself about how you're feeling, something I fear Sean hasn't entirely been doing. We were meant to meet up a couple of weeks ago, but he had to reschedule because he was having a lot of anxiety and panic attacks and things. So um, I think he's going through a really tough time at the moment. I'm hoping he feels he can talk to me about what's been going on. <laughs> How are you doing? Oh, good. Yeah. Good. Hanging in there. 
I am um, what we call in recovery lapsing. Um, and I lapsed into doing drugs again. Um, I came home from work. It was a bad day of work. I just really wanted to just do nothing. And I got a text from someone I previously did drugs with because I was so down on myself and my self-worth. And before I knew it, the voice in my head to wanting to go and do drugs, it made my heart really beat out my chest. I was thinking, finally, I'm going to get some. Finally, I'm going to get what I want. Finally, I'm going to go back to what I felt was normal. It's clear Sean is still in the midst of some very tough times, but he seems so together. Putting on a brave face is something I do too. So you know when we met last time yeah. and talking about kind of glossing over things or making things sound like everything's fine and you were saying stuff to me like, yeah. um, I was drugged and raped and mm. this happened and this happened, but you know, it was a real positive experience and here I am now and like, it just sounded like it was so hard for you and I felt yeah. like you weren't acknowledging that. Yeah, I don't like the memory of it. Yeah. But at the same time, um, I do think about it. I, I think about it a lot. Um, the moments that I talk about anything personal, um, I always put on a smile because I don't like anyone thinking that I'm weak or yeah. vulnerable or things that make me look like I'm damaged goods. And those moments, especially that moment of me getting raped, it was... I don't know what to say. It was um, a difficult time because I, I still blame myself. And Why? I, Why do you blame yourself? I guess it's that bad habit of beating myself up. Yeah. Trying to see what I did wrong instead of seeking help to try and go, OK, you went through this. Let's move on from that. I really just pushed it down, hence why I'm always smiling and always giving this I'm fine, Persona. <laughs> I don't know, it's like some of the stuff that he was saying, like, hearing it is quite hard because, you know, he's saying like he still blames himself for being raped. Like, what the fuck? Like, you know, it's really, it's so, so. It's just people should love to feel like that. God. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, it's just it's horrible. It does really hit close to home because, you know, it's like, I feel like it's just something that me and my friends have had experience with. I've had friends that aren't here anymore because, you know, and it's like, if one more per if one more person goes that way, it's like I can't. <laughs> like it's not right. <laughs> like, guys aren't maybe doing too much drugs, and <sighs> it's just scary how it can be like one step away from those people being lost to us, you know. And like I don't want that to happen to Sean. <laughs> I really don't. We're losing too many gay men to drugs. A recent report by Imperial College claims someone dies every 12 days in London just from the chemsex drug G. And drug use generally within the LGBT community is thought to be seven times higher than the general population. I think lots of this is down to self-worth. Following his laps, I'm so pleased that Sean is seeking further help from the drugs programme he was on. Antidote is the UK's only LGBT-specific drug and alcohol service and is based at London Friend. All right. I'm just very grateful to Sean for, for letting me hear about his story. All our stories are connected, you know, and it's, we can all relate to that. And I, I, I still do it, you know, I still put on a put on a smile because, you know, I think being honest with ourselves about the wounds that we've been dealt and the scars that we have is part of the process, you know. To 
Today, my band, Years and Years, are headlining the Mighty Hoopla Festival in London. Well, Mighty Hoopla is a festival kind of organised by the Sink the Pink crew, who are a queer kind of collective. Should be a really queer event, um, lots of LGBT people. I don't actually know where I'm going. <laughs> I think I need to get into a car. If I look back at myself 10 years ago, the main difference is now I know how to take care of my own mental health. Like, I have the tools available to me so that if something comes up, I can be like, pow, you know, knock that back. There's a little gap here. <laughs> Do you want me to cover that? Yes. Yeah? Yeah, Phil. Well, this is a first. Are you wearing a jock strap? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah? You like yes. this? I had this bright idea that I would like to be oh, yeah, just cool. in my gold underwear covered in gold glitter. So that's what <laughs> has been happening. That's what's happening right now. It's been covered in gold glitter. Just so I have these ideas and then... Getting stuck in. Make them happen. <laughs> Everyone thought I was joking, but wasn't it? <laughs> How you doing, Margie? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm just wearing normal clothes. <laughs> looking normal. <gasps> oh, my God! <laughs> yeah. I think we have a real opportunity here to help younger generations and the ones that come after them. It's a choice between kids having low self-esteem, damaged, feeling undeserving of love, ashamed, versus encouragement and positivity for them to live their authentic selves and be who they are. We have to do everything we can to make sure that happens. Are we all on? Yeah, man. I just need to reverse. What do you do? <laughs> and then it becomes unquestioned and normal that we have inclusive LGBT sex and relationship education. It becomes normal that parents know how to talk to their kids about their sexuality, and then we can try and stop what's the suffering and pain that's happening. I think it's, it is really hard not to let how you grew up, growing up gay in a straight world, affect you. My journey has been really trying to reconcile everything that happened to me growing up. And, you know, now I do things I never dreamed I would do. I go on stage in, you know, crazy outfits. I'm really out to everybody and I get to spread a message in front of thousands of people. The queer community inspires me every day. We're a very, very diverse community, but I think one thing that we can have in common is the love and support for each other. So, <laughs> and um, one thing that I've learned recently is like how hard we all find it to talk, like really, really to talk. You need to have, take some time to actually listen to somebody because it can make such a difference. So this tent, loves you, like, no matter what sexuality, gender, what your body looks like, what you look like, whether you're femme, whether you're mass, whether you're young or old, like, we look out for each other. Okay. <laughs> you deserve to have a happy life. Never think that you shouldn't have love or you shouldn't be entitled to a happy family or, 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 or whatever you want, you deserve to have them. Young LGBT people are like the strongest, bravest, most inspiring people I know.